Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female, female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people, and they're dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So how did Job respond to such horrible news and circumstances where he lost absolutely everything and none of it was his fault? What did Job do? Was he bitter? Did he arise and gather an army to go after the Sabians and the Chaldeans who stole thousands of his animals and slaughtered them and slaughtered many of his servants? Or did he go and sue the contractor who built the house of his oldest son for not making it strong enough to withstand the, the wind that came across the wilderness? Or did he blame God for the fire that fell from heaven and burned up his sheep and servants? Um, from verse 20, we know that he didn't do any of those things, but he did five other things. Verse 20, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. He fell on the ground and he worshiped. And he said in his worship, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, you are sovereign over every single little detail of our lives. Help us to see that we deserve nothing but eternal death, and you deserve nothing less than our worship. Grant us this morning a time where we could offer you our true worship. We thank you, Lord, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, let us come to God as we are today. Sing grace alone. I'm not 
child of God by grace and grace sacrifice his son Isaac. In verse 5 it says, he, Abraham, said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Um, notice how there is no music involved in this, um, in this story. The first time worship is mentioned is through a sacrifice of a son. This week we are doing communion and as we remember Jesus, obeying God and sacrificing himself by dying on the cross. For, ne for me, um, every now and then, I see glimpses of Jesus in the, in the people around me. Um, for me, it's the, the older men that, I, that it, um, are in my life, uh, men that are uh, married longer than I am, have kids, uh, that have been in uh, ministry longer than I have been. And um, I see them daily taking up their own cross and making sacrifices to worship God. Um, they put the kingdom of God first in their lives, even if it means putting aside their own desires. When I witness this and other men who have been um, doing this, um, I see these sacrifices as, as being difficult. But when you compare them to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, it's, it doesn't compare. Um, I can't imagine how painful physically and emotionally um, what his death on the cross must have been for him. He did it in obedience to God, the Father, and his love for us. As we sing this next song, I invite you to reflect on the cross and to dig deep to see in what areas of your life you can sacrifice as you worship God.
sing all for love. I see you at the cross, you're crying all for love. My God, my love, you gave it all. I hear the angels shouting, it was all. for the cross and um, just the the painful um, thought of sending your son to the cross Um, we thank you that Jesus um, obeyed you and willingly um, sacrificed himself We thank you that he also uh, resurrected so that we can have eternal life. And uh, we just reflect on um, sacrifice this morning and um, how our true worship comes from sacrifice, um, whether it is um, physical things like time, money, and um, our own human desires, God. Um, We give them to you in sacrifice, in worship, and um, just as you gave it all on the cross, we want to give our lives to you. And in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus gave it all and all for love. That's why we're here, and we are so happy to gather this morning to partake the Holy Communion. Let us now prepare our hearts to receive the Holy Communion. Holy Communion is uh, when we, uh, as Christians, we come together to celebrate and also to remember God's love for the world, through the death and resurrection of the Christ Jesus, our Lord. And as uh, written in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting from verse 23, please rise for God's word. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'd like to invite the two ushers to come up here to pass out the pre-filled cups.
There are two elements in here. Please take the bread out. We want to partake this together. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Please partake together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, your grace. Thank you for your perfect sacrifice on the cross because of your love for us. And with your death and resurrection, we, our sins are forgiven and we are given the right to become your sons and daughters. We are so grateful for your love. Please continue to remind us that we have the responsibility to love others to forgive others, and also to share your good news to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated and let the usher to collect the uh, used cups. How's everyone's morning? All right, so uh, as usual, I'll be doing the uh, the prayer requests announced. I don't know why I said as usual. This is only our second time <laughs> this week we're doing it. <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, so let me just check real quick. And um, it looks like we have none. So <laughs> uh, yeah, once again, just a friendly reminder that um, if you have any prayer requests you would like to submit, just scan the QR code at the front of the door or on the slide. And um, yeah, we'll be more than happy to um, pray for you, whether it's through here in the service or um, through the English Ministry um, Leadership Board. All right, let us rise and let us uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we just we just thank you so much for your presence here this morning. We thank you for a time where we can worship you, where we can praise you, and we can be reminded of not only your your love but your sacrifice as well. And we just thank you so much for sacrificing your son so that we can have a bridge to you, God, so that we can have a connection a relationship with you and we just thank you so much for um, having that with you god i just pray for the church i pray for all of us as a whole um, as one body as one unity that we may continue to learn to grow to fellowship to understand one another and to learn your word and to um, apply that to our daily lives God, we just thank you so much for our people here. We just thank you so much that um, we can continue to serve here. We can continue to grow here. We can continue to fellowship and just grow along with one another and to grow for the sake of your kingdom, God. We just thank you so much again for your mercy and your grace we just thank you that you are always there for us, even if it is um, in the darkest of times or even in the brightest of times. We just thank you for being um, the everlasting light in our lives. And God, we just thank you so much for um, our community outside of this church as well, um, to those that are preaching or sharing your word. Um, even um, far beyond where we are right now, 
we just continue to pray for those that are sharing your word, sharing your gospel, sharing the truth, and that is um, that you are good, God, and that your love is great. And we just thank you so much that um, we can continue to glorify your name and to remember um, who you are and what you have done for us. Um, pray for the message that we're about to receive, that we continue to learn and build in wisdom um, through your word. And we just thank you so much um, for just being here with us this morning. We pray in all things in your precious name. Amen. Please remain standing as the scriptures will be read to us. I'll be reading Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the son of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desire of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being the rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You may be seated. He's going to be okay. He bounces back more than any of us do. I just feel sorry for kids that have to grow up now in this. I think I got it wrong. Growing up is getting used to the world. This is easier for them. This isn't the world. This isn't it. It might be. giving up. That's reality until we see otherwise. This is what we have to live with. When I was a kid, I asked my grandpa once if he ever killed any Germans in the war. He wouldn't answer. He said that was grown-up stuff, so. So I asked if the Germans ever tried to kill him. But he got real quiet. He said he was dead the minute he stepped into enemy territory. Every day he woke up, told himself, rest in peace, now get up and go to war. And then after a few years of pretending he was dead, he made it out alive. And that's the trick of it, I think. We 
do what we need to do, and then we get to live. But no matter what we find in D.C., I know we'll be okay. Because this is how we survive. We tell ourselves that we are the walking dead. Good morning. I uh, hope you're doing uh, well this Sunday morning and you're prepared to fight off uh, all the Sunday scaries. Uh, I don't know if you know what that term means. I actually just recently found out what it means. Uh, it, it, it basically refers to the feeling of anxiety and dread that we all have on Sundays as the weekend is coming to a close. And um, soon, the very next day, we're going to have to go back to work, or for many of you, go back to school. And, uh, you know, this anxiety, this feeling, it, it could even affect us physically. It could give us stomach aches, it could give us headaches, and many other ailments. It's sort of an anticipatory um, anxiety uh, that, that affects us, that the, the anticipation uh, of us having to uh, go drone back into work or into school uh, where um, t into the beginning of the week where we uh, uh, go on um, doing the same work over and over again in a very tired uh, state. And it's no wonder that uh, the it's no wonder that zombies are often used as a metaphor to uh, uh, speak of our uh, constantly working selves, our burnt out selves. Uh, you know, speaking of zombies, uh, you might not have been able to tell, uh, but the show that uh, of the scene that you just uh, saw uh, is called. Um, it's it's a, it's a zombie show, and um, interestingly enough, in the scene that I showed. The title of the uh, show is actually said by one of the characters. It's one of those cool moments where you point at a TV and you're like, aha, they, they did that, right? Um, but, uh, you know, the zombies have for a long time been a uh, part of our media culture. And often they are a metaphor for many things. Me they're a metaphor for things that we are ultimately afraid of. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, it would have been the Red Scare, and they represented our, our fear of communists. Maybe a little later, it, it represented our fear, the, the fear of consumerism, you know, taking over us. And uh, yet even, you know, more recent, it represents uh, pathogens or viruses spreading uh, around the world and, and our fight against us. And as we've seen over the past uh, a few years of the pandemic, that's something that is um, uh, very apparent to us. But more recently, um, uh, there's been, as, as the, the stories about zombies have begin, be getting uh, darker and darker, uh, it becomes, uh, the, what they represent becomes something else, something even more scary, in that they come to represent us. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, well, in 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 that scene and in the sh greater show itself, The Walking Dead, um, you know, often you think about The Walking Dead referring to uh, the zombies, but really the show is trying to demonstrate that The Walking Dead equally, if not more, refers to the human survivors of a zombie uh, apocalypse, uh, in that they observe all the death, all the evil. Um, surrounding them, and they themselves succumb to it. They themselves become part of the evil, and, uh, and they kill each other, they uh, do wicked things that they never would have thought that they uh, would do. And in this sense, 
uh, zombies then become a metaphor of the evil that resides within all of us. It's a sort of bleak picture of humanity. Um, what that scene kind of reminded me of was, was a, uh, a, a couple of years ago, um, when I was still in Scotland, I was part of a church uh, small group. And uh, in the small group was this uh, middle-aged man named Michael. And Michael, uh, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, he was diagnosed with a terminal heart disease. So unfortunately, he was only given uh, a couple years to live. And that was, you know, incredibly sad because of his, um, you know, his, his wife and his 10-year-old son knew that very soon that they were going to be uh, without um, uh, the wife for her husband and then the kid was going to be without uh, his father. But if you were to talk to Michael, if you, uh, if, if you got to meet Michael, uh, if he didn't happen to tell you about his condition, you would never have guessed that he had this terminal condition. He was one of the most cheery people in, uh, in our church. Uh, he was uh, always upbeat, uh, even though not only he, had, he was dealing with that, he was dealing with a, a whole bunch of other illnesses that plagued him since he was growing up. But you would never know that about him. In fact, you know, he was probably the most evangelistic out of all of us in, in the church. He often uh, talked about his faith the most uh, amongst the church, but also outside of the church. And during our, you know, our many small groups where we would have prayer time, uh, the source of many of our prayer requests was, of course, his, his health and his, his illness. Um, even, even though that we knew it was, and uh, there was nothing that uh, apparently could, could, could be done, um, that he was going to die, um, we continued praying on for him. And a lot, of the, a lot of times we would do it from a somber state. But when he talked about his own terminal illness, he talked about it in a cheerful way, in a way uh, that um, was full of light and, and full of hope. And sometimes we were, we, I think he could tell that we were um, thrown off by this. And so one of these times when we were talking about him, he, he said something to the group that uh, I, I haven't forgotten since. He, he basically said that, um, you know, in, in talking about his terminal illness, he says, well, when you really think about it, in a sense, we're all terminal. What, what Michael was saying in, 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 in that we're all terminal is that he, he's merely pointing out to the brutal reality that all of us are going to die someday. All of us, you know, going about our daily lives, um, we're just going through the motions and, uh, 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 and pretending like it's not the case that we're just marching and inching towards the same fate that um, uh, all of us cannot prevent. Just like Michael can't prevent his terminal illness, we, we, I mean, we, we will also eventually die. We can't prevent that. Um, death. And so, interestingly enough, you know, um, Michael says, uh, and Michael saying that, oh, we are all terminal, he's kind of saying something similar to what the fictional character Rick is saying in the scene, and saying that we are the walking dead. And uh, of course, right, the, the context is, is a lot different um, than in, 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 uh, in both circumstances. Um, Michael, he's talking about um, our terminal condition as, mor as mortal creatures, as creatures that will die. And in this scene uh, that you just watched, um, Rick was talking about not only needing to survive the zombies, but also to survive um, the, the threat of other humans. And uh, that in order to do that, they themselves would have to resort to any means necessary. Uh, even if that means killing their own humanity, killing whatever goodness resides in them, even if that means succumbing to the evil that is around us. You know, 
but still, what m my friend Michael said and what Rick said is still kind of essentially the same. But what makes it different is their intention behind it. And it, give, it, it makes us ask the question, you know, all of us observe the painful truth that um, there is evil surrounding all of us and there is suffering that's going on in this world. And a lot of the times, maybe we get to the point where we realize that evil is within us and maybe we experience uh, our own suffering. And so the question comes, what makes one desire to love on others, to um, uh, uh, cherish uh, the, the time that they, they have and to live life uh, um, uh, to the fullest and sacrificing themselves to others? And what makes other people um, uh, pursue uh, trying to save themselves? Uh, to save themselves, even if that means sacrificing others. You know, in, in the former sense, in, in, both, in both circumstances, both are realizing that from their own perspective, from their own efforts, it's a losing battle. And so the only thing to do is to operate as though you are already dead. But the difference, um, as we will continue to see uh, in today's passage, is that on, on one hand, uh, while it is, a, is solely the belief that um, thinking one is dead only will lead to uh, life, on the other hand, thinking one to be dead, uh, it just doesn't remain there, but something else has to be added on top to it. Something else has to, um, outside of the individual, lead to life. And so in some way, um, Michael's perspective is actually a little bit more bleak than, than, than Rick, because Rick believes that in acting as though he um, uh, isn't, um, is dead, that in that he will find life. But anyways, um, we're, we're gonna be going today, uh, today uh, we're gonna be exploring uh, the second, the beginning to the second chapter of Ephesians. Um, as a reminder, we've been going through this, uh, uh, the epistle to the Ephesians as a, a series. And in the first chapter, you saw uh, very much so how uh, Paul is front loading the letter with this proclamation of what God is doing. Uh, what God is doing, uh, what God has done in sending uh, his son to die on the cross for us uh, and raising him from the dead and in so doing, raising us from the dead. But, what, I mean, what I find curious sometimes is that uh, a lot of times in church, we seem to be the kind of place that forgets that. And we seem to be the kind of place that uh, when we come to church, it's just for us to learn more about how we're terrible people and how bad we are. You know, not, not that we as a church fail to mention uh, that uh, uh, mentioned Jesus and his work, but proportionally speaking, often I feel what happens is that uh, our sin is spoken more often uh, than uh, our savior who saves us from our sin. And so maybe um, if we look at, at uh, the beginning of today's passage, we can see, uh, we, we can uh, see that sort of theme again, that sort of, uh, focusing on uh, death and, and sin. And as we see in this passage, it says, uh, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of uh, this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirits that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all, all uh, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Pretty bleak, peach, uh, a pretty bleak uh, picture here. And you could obviously see the um, comparisons uh, to, to zombies, right? In the sense that we're, we're uh, um, us as evil 
um, beings just seek out the desires of the flesh, similar to how zombies uh, seek out to eat flesh. But, I mean, this is even more despairing in the sense that um, it's saying that that's kind of where we started out. We started out in this uh, walking in this dead path, walking in this uh, uh, course of the world and following Satan. But before we go on to the next part, the next uh, but God part, if, if I were to offer a, a semi-spoiler, I want to sh show that even in the midst of, of this sort of bleak explanation of our state, of our state in sin and our state in the fall, that Paul is actually already working in um, hope, working in uh, 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 some signs that all is not lost. Uh, for instance, I mean, it, it starts, uh, you, you can see it very clearly in the beginning, it says, and you were dead. So it's talking firstly about an event that happened in the past or something that is in the past. And more than that, um, we find here uh, this language of following the, the prince of the power of the air. Um, in other words, that's talking about Satan. Uh, the, the, Satan is described here, uh, the power of the air, is basically all the gods that we make of the world, uh, of the material world in front of us, uh, whether that be um, um, the gods of, um, of greed, of uh, material success, of, of uh, praise, of glory, all of these things that um, lead us to be uh, zombies are because we turn these various material things into their own gods. But it's not, the, 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 the little bit of hope that we do have here is that um, something else outside of us is sort of working these things within us. Of course, we, we by nature are, uh, um, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But that element of, of evil was planted into us by something outside of us. And that person outside of us was Satan. Now what Paul is not saying here is that, is that oh, uh, because, of, uh, because of Satan doing these, these things upon you, you are not at all at blame. We are still cooperating with Satan in this. You know, just like in the zombie apocalypse, we, we, we can't just say, oh, just because the world is terrible doesn't mean you could go on killing other human survivors to um, save your own self, right? It, it, it offers an explanation, but it doesn't offer a full excuse. And similarly, I think that's what Paul is actually trying to do here in the sense that it's offering a, uh, uh, kind of an explanation of why we are the way we are without uh, abdicating uh, us of any uh, of, of responsibility. Uh, we are still responsible for the ways in which we, uh, we walk. However, as we see in the next uh, part, all is not lost, we get uh, the two words which I think um, I think many people have pointed out are some of the two most beautiful words, uh, words in, in the whole uh, Bible, which is, but God. And so uh, God comes in, God is the savior. And as we, we um, learned about in church, uh, we learned that he came uh, to save us from our death. But this is emphasizing that even more, even more to, to the point of seemingly uh, co uh, um, contradicting what, what uh, has been said uh, about us in, in the prior text. I'll read it in full. It says that, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Now, I don't intend 
to resolve how it is that while we were dead in our trespasses, we were made alive together in Christ. I think that's an ultimate mystery. I think that's something that is element of faith that we are to um, um, accept. But what I do want to point out is um, the sort of, uh, I'm using a, a complicated word, paradox. Paradox basically just means two, two truths that seemingly contradict each other, but uh, in fact don't contradict each other. In the first part, and us being spiritual zombies, um, there's a sense, I mean, the concept of the zombie itself, you have a, uh, a being that is biologically dead, but continues to walk on, or whatsoever. Um, and so over there you have that uh, uh, small paradox. But in this case, it's even a greater paradox. Because what it's talking about is uh, two different kinds of death. If we go back to the prior um, uh, part here, when it's talking about how we are dead in our trespasses, it's bringing up a different kind of death than the death that we typically talk about, the death of biological death, the death where um, you might say our soul leaves our body. But in this case, it's talking about a death in which our souls are still tied to our body. That in still being tied to our body in an overly idolatrous way, we ourselves become dead. It is more talking about uh, the, uh, the walking dead of the surviving humans in, in the show who um, uh, through doing just terrible, terrible things, uh, kill their own goodness within themselves. And so this next part is saying something incredibly strong, <laughs> which is that even while we were um, both dead in the ways that we were living, which in fact lead to our very deaths, even while that is true, we are also alive with Christ. And um, there's, there's so much more that uh, one can go uh, into um, regarding uh, 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 this, and it should provide a lifetime of reflection. But what I want to focus on next is what this means for us. What, what this means for us in the now, um, because we're talking about something, we're talking about a past that we are still living in, and yet we are to, said to be um, made in this uh, present of being alive with Christ. It's something that we can't even comprehend, even though it's the truest thing about us that we are alive in Christ. We could... We feel, we feel death. We feel all the shame that uh, we have when we, when we sin and when we see all the sufferings in the world. We feel that the most, and yet the truest thing about us is that we are actually alive. And so in this next part, what Paul does is give an explanation of uh, what this grace that leads us to be uh, alive in Christ, what this gr grace actually does in our life. And of course, you know, we get to the famous, you know, you've probably done a memory verse uh, on this before about um, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. And that is very, very important, but often it's sort of isolated from this and use as a way of, oh, you better be grateful, right? You better be grateful that you're saved. You know, don't, don't talk about uh, uh, anything uh, what's, uh, uh, whatsoever of, of your own. And while that is in part true, I think what goes on before and after this sort of modifies um, how we take that very uh, famous 
versed. Uh, first off, um, it talks about sort of the future, the, the, the future results of what this grace will, will give us. Um, but it, it speaks about it in a present tense, which is odd, right? So, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And this is the part where, for by grace you have been saved through faith, uh, comes along. And uh, the, the reason why he is saying, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This added part is sort of um, to make sure that God's uh, grace, the grace that comes forth from his love, is so all-encompassing that uh, every single thing that is given to us, every, every single thing that is called of us, it's actually done by God. And that includes faith. I, I think I mentioned this in, in not only in, in the previous sermon, but the, uh, but the sermon before that, that um, faith itself, we, we tend to uh, construe faith as another work. Oh, we need to, you know, uh, change ourselves. We need to force ourselves to believe in uh, this truth about Jesus in order to be saved. And we turn it into another conditional. In order to be saved, we need to believe. But what that does is, is basically uh, just throw in one last work. Even though we, we, we say, oh, we are not saved by our works at all. But the one work we have to do is faith. Jesus, uh, uh, Paul is, is, is sort of pushing up against this and seeing even the act of faith is an act that comes from God. It is, a, it is a gift from God that is provided through grace. And what this does, the good news that all of this provides, is that is in the last sentence here that I've put in, in bold. It says that, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, this seems to be contradictory to what has just been said. Oh, it's nothing about good works. Good works don't matter at all, it seems. But it says we are created for good works. We are created to do good works. And so what's going on here? What's going on here is Paul's um, over-encompassing uh, view of grace, or pa Paul attempting to show us how God's goodness and how God's grace um, uh, over encompasses all that we know more than we can even uh, perceive. And it's actually through God's grace, the same grace that saves you, that saves you from all the sins and your past life of, of walking in, in evil, that same grace is the same grace that propels you to do good works and actually enables you to do good works. And it is in the doing of those good works that you are um, cooperating with God in a similar way that you were prior to that, cooperating with uh, uh, Satan. But in this case, it is all due to what God is doing. And, and, and part, part of fulfilling this is remembering that, keeping hold on that. And keeping hold on the fact um, that uh, we will rise again with uh, uh, Jesus that that is the eternal hope that we are looking for. It's not merely, the, the, the act of resurrection is not merely an idea. It's, it's not even merely an, uh, an event that happened in history. 
the idea of the resurrection, or, or the resurrection is primarily a revelation of who we are meant to be. That this first creation that we went through, this creation in which we fell and we are at fault for, uh, um, for all the things that, uh, bad things that we have done, that that is, um, that that is overcome by this second creation, this recreation of ourselves into what God had already originally meant for us, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, you might put it like this, even regardless of the fall, we would still be in need of following Jesus. But because of the fall, um, we are in this state in, um, in which uh, what we have to do is uh, be reborn. But the truth of this rebirth does a number of things. First off, uh, the resurrection, it gives us hope in the midst of all despair and even the despair of death. What I mean by this is that, like, you know, oftentimes in this life, with the best of our intentions, we will still be wronged. We will still be um, attacked. We will still be hurt. Even when we try to put out love in, in, in the most um, uh, beautiful and awe-inspiring way, we will still... Um, receive death. We, we will still uh, receive opposition. I mean, think of Jesus and his, and his ministry as well. And so in that sense, uh, because we have this hope of the resurrection, it gives us nothing to lose. So it, it fuels us to even more uh, uh, um, live a life of love and a, li a life of obedience to God. Because even whatever comes our way, we know that um, uh, the worst that someone can do to us is kill us. And yeah, that sounds, that's really bad. But especially because we believe in the resurrection, um, the, the idea of death is no longer um, something that prevents us from loving, prevents us from following the commandment to love God and love neighbor. And secondly, the resurrection hope, uh, this revelation, it, it gives us the freedom to will the good, to uh, follow in God's footsteps. Why is that? It's because, you know, if we know that we are forgiven, if we know that the source of all the good that we do is not us, but of God, really it allows us to f be free from feeling like we're gonna mess up, right? Oftentimes, <laughs> I don't know if you, you, you experience this like me, but oftentimes when I am told, don't do this, don't do that, it actually uh, uh, leads me to be af afraid of actually doing positive actions of the good, to do actual, actual loving actions because I fear that I'll mess up and, and, and do something bad. What God's grace does, what in knowing that all of our sins are forgiven and that we are given this new life is that it actually offers true freedom. You see, we, we think we are three in being able to choose between uh, the good and the bad, but the truest sense of freedom is having the freedom to only do the good. And of course, that's, that's not what we're going to achieve until we are resurrected and we're fully perfected. But in the now, we recognize that, okay, when we do ill, that is our former selves. But when we do good, that is Christ living within us. And so, you know, our sufferings and our wrongdoings then are ill compared to the future glory that is revealed to us. 
And so if we were to go back, back to um, comparing the fictional character of Rick and my friend Michael, what, what is the difference? What is the difference between uh, responding to the evil within us uh, with more evil and responding to the evil within us with more love? What is the difference? I think it's in realizing uh, that it's not enough to tell us that we are the walking dead. It's not enough to tell us that we are sinners. It's not enough to tell us that, that we are evil. Instead, we must listen to God telling us that through Christ living in us, we become the walking living. We become those who are able to walk in his light. And the latter takes faith. The latter takes, in some sense, dying to yourself. But it is most realized in holding onto that faith, which frees us to live the righteous life, which in turn bolsters that faith. And so with that, it, it, in living in this way and in holding on to the faith that leads us to live in that way, we are coming back to the midpoint of this passage and the midpoint of all of human history and the midpoint of all of who we are. That God, being rich in his mercy, because of the love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. And so with that, um, as the worship team comes back up, I'm going to be doing something a little different. I'll be doing the typical uh, prayer sort of thing. But following the prayer, um, we will have another sort of call to worship where you'll be uh, standing up and reading alongside me um, a... Uh, sort of creed, it, it was actually a creed that was heavily related to the uh, uh, communion in the history of the church, but it's something to uh, serve as a memorial for what Jesus has done and how that enables us to live the life that we ought to live, even as we do so uh, imperfectly. And so first, let me bow, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, this opportunity to come to um, church, to hopefully, uh, in coming to church, to fight off the Sunday scaries of us going back into our work weeks, where we could seemingly um, be dead, be tired, and be all the more susceptible to the devil's ways. I thank you so much that um, you have offered um, us this institution, the church, as a reminder uh, of who we truly are, who we truly are meant to be uh, in living in this life, in living in this paradox of simultaneously being dead in our trespasses, but being made alive in your son, Christ. And I pray that, um, that we ourselves, each other, through the tools that we have before us, uh, the tools of the scriptures that you've given us and the tools of the relationships that we build among us, that we ourselves, uh, through the spirit, can be reminders to each other of the simultaneous existence that we find ourselves in. So that inevitably the, the next time that we mess up, that we feel that um, we are walking in, in the ways of the devil, that, that we feel the evil surrounding us, the next time that that happens, that instead of focusing on that, that we turn and we listen to what you say, God. We listen to your intervention in our lives. That it wasn't about our efforts in the first place, 
but about what you did for your son. And you say and pray, amen. And so, uh, oh. oh, so uh, if you, as we prepare for worship, if you can uh, stand up and uh, read in response, uh, read the bold alongside uh, with me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. According to his commandment, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. respond to this truth, um, this hope, this grace, um, how, do, how do we respond? How do we, um, how do we give to God during this time? Um, the chorus of this next song says, your goodness makes me want to sing. Your mercy brings me to my knees. Your faithfulness is with me till the end. Your kindness makes me want to repent. And um, the, what we just listened to makes me re want to repent. It makes me want to turn away from my sin and look to Jesus and um, come to him and just be thankful. So let us glorify him as we sing this next song.
Be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday.